Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another episode of the Rule 34 podcast. I'm your host Jack, joined by my fellow co-host. Uh, Dominic Castillo with a six foot uh, cardboard standee. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. And I also forgot to say again, season two of the Rule 34 podcast. We've come far, we've come long, and here we are. Pog Chan, bro. So, as you were telling me before we started recording, Dom, you started up school, correct? Yes, as of this week's Wednesday, I've begun my sophomore year of college at UC Berkeley. Yet, I'm still doing it online, at home, nowhere near UC Berkeley. But it is what it is. So, what classes are you taking? Uh, give me once. Uh, really? Oh, right. Well, what was I saying? Um, about my class. Yeah, my classes, my classes. Uh, so far, I'm just taking like a bit of an easier route for the time being. Um, j- just because I really want to want once I want to go back to going back in person in Brooklyn, I don't want to have to take the immediately more difficult class that I want to take. Um, I already I already have a bit of a plan of what I want to do. Um, might maybe start taking like um, computer engineering classes, like introductory computer engineering. Mm. Um, but um, I'm still gonna have to see about that stuff. For the time being, I just got the, like you know regular like four unit classes. Um, that, that satisfy that satisfy the general requirements because um, because I'm still undeclared at the moment because I still don't know what I want to do. Mm. But yeah. The only problem with that is that I don't have much time left. I think it's until until next semester or until one or two semesters down the road where I'm, I am going to be forced to uh, select a major or at least a major and a minor to go along with uh, for my bachelor's degree. But I don't know. You, you know, I, I just don't know what major to go for. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I guess. I'm still... Because I still don't know what I want to do. I, I like I don't know if I should go for something difficult or you know play the easy route. I don't know, go into something for like I don't know sociology as a major because that's practically like the easy route you know in life in terms of college. Uh, in terms of getting a college degree, in my opinion, I'm probably wrong, but I mean, well, there's I think, there's, wait, is, there's like three ways you can go with this. You can do the hard route, which is, you know, choosing a class and like, uh, or not, not necessarily a class, but, you know, like choosing a whole major and career that like, you know, is going to require taking a bunch of difficult classes and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, get that major put in that work, even if it's not something you necessarily like. There's right. the easy route that you kind of mentioned, which is, you know just taking a major that is considered easy in a sense, like the courses and stuff, is like at least easy to you and doing that. And then just, you know, having that degree and then you can go find a, a work, a career that maybe not even relates to it. Mm-hmm. And that kind of ties into the third route, which is the route I'm taking where I tested out a bunch of courses. And now I'm ta- I put, I've based my major on, what classes I enjoyed taking, even if it's not really a career I have in mind or, you know, a major I really had in mind, but it's like the fact that I'm enjoy I've enjoyed the classes I've taken under that major. And right. so even though it's not necessarily necessarily something I thought I'd major in or even go into a career in, it at least makes it easier to get through these four years of school because I'm learning and or I'm I'm learning and I'm enjoying what I'm learning in the class that I'm taking. You get me? Yeah, I guess. So like that's the, like three routes you can approach. Hmm. You do like the, the the last the latter two routes. You know, as I mentioned, you know they don't necessarily have like a full uh, like a full thought out plan. You know. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, you don't necessarily need. Like, you don't need to have everything planned out. You should really, like, start taking things day by day, you know? Yeah. Because, you know, thinking about the future too much is going to cause a lot of unnecessary stress. You're going to... 
you you should worry about like the future and stuff obviously you should put some thought into it now but because of how uncertain things are because of how plans continually change you know you know what they say what's it called uh those who make a plan more than never you know stick to it yeah. or like the plan never goes according to what you had planned you know or things don't go according to what you had planned you know so it's like because of that you shouldn't really necessarily think too much about it which is why you know i did the latter route of just doing what's not necessarily easy but you know intriguing and fun to me which is taking the courses i'm enjoying yeah i agree because like my dad always says you know it's not really what you major in that matters it's just about the fact that you got that degree especially because you know with that degree even if you were like like you got in something like sociology you said there's still a certain skill set that applies to sociology that in yeah. turn other careers and jobs would want you know and so they'll look and be like you know what, what does it matter if he majored in sociology these are like the skills that he has that would fit this job you know or something like that yeah so uh, tr that's my only advice to you is just try not to think too hard about you know career and just kind of look at what classes you enjoy yeah because you know school's easier to get through when you actually enjoy it right 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 i think it's for me i just uh it's it's a bit of a weird thing for me only because like i really want to do like the computer engineering side of things but it's just it's it's very very difficult especially when it comes to like the uh side of of um classes per se uh especially with like my original thought of process of going into berkeley with uh the idea of, of, of going into how would you say uh business administration or principal of business hmm. i believe like a really small percentage even make it into the Haas school of business which is like the major like program just to get you know uh, your bachelor's title under the name of uh of business administration hmm. so that immediately along with my pretty bad grades I start off with the first semester um, uh, of my classes, I don't have a good chance. Like, you know, I'll be honest, I don't have a good chance. And I'm pretty sure I'm playing down myself. So but after that, I'm starting to now think of like different routes of what I really want to do with my college education in terms of uh, if, I should go the, if I should go the easy route or the more difficult route. But with the more difficult route, there's a high risk high reward with the risk being you know uh academic dismissal of my uh, grades go you know tank or you know a high reward I, I i leave with the name of under business administration with all this knowledge but you know i don't i don't i, I don't really see myself you know in a cubicle just working tirelessly just working and you know crunching numbers if that makes sense so here's, sure you know yeah, i know uh, exactly what you're talking about so Here's what I recommend, and it's a piece of advice that my brother essentially took. Not necessarily like it was straightforward advice that someone gave him, but it was like through his own observation that he took this piece of advice. And it was uh, through looking at Mr. Solis. You know, for those who probably know Mr. Solis, he is a math teacher, and he also was an art teacher as well. You know, he basically taught both at times. Right. You know, and so, you know, he made, he went to SC, I believe, for math. I always, I, I don't have that good memory. Right, correct? I believe so, yeah. But, you know, if we know, you know, for the most part, you know, the main thing he wanted to do was, like, art or, like, teach it, I guess. Right. You know, but so, like, you know, what I'm trying to get is, you know, he, he, he has both the math and art skill set, you know, one that's more so, like, a passion, you know, with art. I mean, you probably still considered math a passion as well. But right. so, the, like, the the observation my brother took was that, you know, so he's got this degree in math, and he also got one in art. And it was that, like, you know, the, the advice I'm trying to give you here is maybe look at something that, like, will be, like, your, like, job, per se. And right. it's something you want to, like, do on the side, maybe in your own time. Like, if you want to truly pursue computer engineering, maybe, you know, do something in college. Like, you know, like how you're saying, just doing the sociology thing to get a degree. 
Right. But then on the side where you don't have to worry, you know, like about like academics and grades being an issue on the side, learn it through like online programs and stuff, not necessarily through a college system. Because sure, you know, through a college system, it's going to be like essentially like better or like it's more so it's more so teaching you how to do it as a job, you know? Yeah. But like if you want to just pursue it on the side, you know, there's that option, you know, where so it's like. You just get that degree so that you can get yourself a, a good job. And then whatever passions you have on the side, you pursue it with whatever time you have remaining outside of work, you know? Right. Because that's also a good option. You got a point. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm probably going to follow that advice and think about it a bit more. But, well, yeah, we'll see what happens in the future. I, I might, at the end of the day, just probably just... I want to sort of like cherish like my memories here at Berkeley, even though yeah, I've, you know, erased an entire year at home and now an entire semester plus along with the year. But um, but I I feel like I should just want to want to take it easy, which might be a bad thing. But like, uh, like I, I like I I just don't want to stretch too much. I want to stress you know so, uh, somewhat you know just because I have to work you know just to earn the good grades. But I don't want to stress too much, you know, you know, countless nights drinking coffee just to stay up, just to, you know, study. Yeah, you don't want to affect your, your mentals and physicals too hard. Yeah, exactly, and exactly. I want to have some time, like you, know, said, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, like I said, of the fact that, uh, you know, you really should just focus on learning stuff that you actually want to learn. You know, that that's, that's the beauty and benefit of college is that you get to... Other than, you know, them having requirements for each degree of what, like, classes you need to take, for the most part, you're learning what you actually want to learn. You get to choose what you want to learn, you know? Yeah, Versus exactly. Versus previous exactly. years of school, it's always, oh, well, this is what classes you have, you can't really get out of them. Exactly. But, but yeah, uh, that's, the, that's pretty much the situation uh, for the time being uh, in terms of schooling. Uh, I mean, right now I have like a class, like in two hours uh, at the recording at the time of recording the podcast. So it is what it is. I mean, not only that, but we also deal with you know with work and stuff like that and paying bills. But you know that's daily life. That's daily life. Oh, and and, and uh, my bad, my bad. But like, uh, and speaking about paying for stuff, we might, Jack. You heard it right here. I might be able to buy a new home in Japan. As of right now, maybe, maybe it's a maybe in Japan, and and it's uh it's like a two story, a uh, four bedroom, two bathroom for like around like, uh, like around twenty no twenty yeah yeah like around twenty thousand dollars. Damn, we're getting close. We're getting super close to the dream. Well, then my dream, but the dream, man. Mm, well, there's a lot but of things to consider with that. There's there's like a lot of renovation that has to be done, but I mean. Just like the thought of itself of just owning a home is pretty crazy on its own. But I'm probably still going to have to give it like another year or two just for, you know, anything like, you know, I still got to learn Japanese. I still am right now, but, I just, you know, I ain't perfect. And then you got, like I said, there's a lot of things to consider with that. Yeah. And, you know, citizenship and visas and whatever. But, you, you know, who cares? What about you, Joe? So enough, enough about me. How about, how about you, my man? Uh, doing pretty well. I am going to get a referral soon from my doctor to, uh, essentially refer me to continue online schooling rather than going in person because as of this recording, uh, ice might, even if I put my leg straight, my foot is still not straight. Like right. The entire foot, oh. Not just the toe. It's all curved to like the right. Right, right, So like right. I can't even put it flat when I have my foot flat. I kind of like... Need to lean my foot to the left in order to have it flat. And you know, how can I be expected to walk across campus like that? Jeez, man. So we'll see. We'll see. But other than that, uh, nothing much. I've just been chilling, enjoying my break. Because unlike other students, I go in late, like late September, early October ish. Yeah. But so and, uh, we'll see from there. Yeah, and how, how uh, have you selected your classes yet for the next semester? Or, well, next quarter. I got two classes, and I'm waiting for 
them to unlock the restrictions of you know reserving spots for new students yeah to get my third class nice 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 but uh, uh i would say um what am i gonna say oh yeah uh, are you on like on route and in, in, like graduating and within four years i should be i've been taking a good amount of courses because they've all been like five units each Nice. And uh, the main thing I'm just having to do now is fulfill the requirements that my degree requires. Right. Which is kind of difficult because, like, spots fill up instantly. And then when I try and sign up for a class, they include the restrictions. Right, right, right. But the, the, I should be uh, able to. Uh, I was saying I should be able to, especially because, you know, like I mentioned, the degree oh, yeah. I'm heading towards isn't necessarily one that, like, requires all these different courses that i need to take you know a lot of it's just taking art history classes and uh english courses and see, see. F- fulfilling a science requirement which is the one thing i hate the most right right, right. uh what was gonna say um but doesn't don't they tell you like the various uh like the um i just say the exact time like spots open up for like classes and stuff like that to refill your requirements yeah, they do, but like it, it goes quickly, and sometimes the site goes down because of how many people are trying to uh, sign up for courses. Like, like, bro, I it's the same thing with Berkeley, bro. Like these these guys are like multi millionaire, like one of the universities, and their software is sucks, man. So yeah, stupid. You end up. But with about twenty seven minutes remaining, I, I think it is time we shall move on to today's topic. Yes. Especially because this one was essentially requested by Dominic. So to give context to today's episode, uh, Dom and I have a doc, a Google Doc shared with one another that essentially has, you know, a list of different ideas for this podcast. And I have it split into sections where it's like general topics, uh, the tier list topic, because that's its own mini series, explaining wrestling to Dom because it's another miniseries and then a new one coming soon we don't know yet because we need to come up with an idea for it but so Dom is always looking to see like you know if if we aren't able to freestyle an episode what is the topic we can talk about and when looking at the explaining wrestling section he always saw this one that caught his eye and it was the Montreal screw job and as I was explaining to Mr. Solis when we were recording he was super excited because he agreed with me in the sense that that's like, as I explained it to Dom, like the core piece of lore when it comes to wrestling. Like, I, as I as I said to Dom, this one event becomes a catalyst for a whole new era of wrestling. But so, I guess we'll get into it. Uh, I do have a short video. I'm going to show Dom the actual event that like what it actually is and then i'm going to explain it to him after so we know how this goes i'll pause it right here and then i'll show you the video dom and then we'll come back get reactions to the video and then i'll give you the actual like explanation of what went down yeah all right so just showed down the video real short for first impressions based off of that video for those who don't know it was uh sean michaels putting bret hart in the sharpshooter Ref calls for the bell, and chaos ensues. What reactions, Dom? I feel like, for, like first impressions, I feel like he made some sort of like illegal move. If I, I don't know, I might be wrong, but so okay, he had he had him like locked up in his legs, right? And then it seemed like they were struggling or something, and it seemed like the ref was trying to call it off or something. I don't, I don't know what was going on, but then they just stopped for a second he just let him go and then they and then people just started like 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 you know getting rowdy and stuff and i I don't know what was going on and then the ref just jumped out and then like people just started immediately just coming in like people just started coming in real quick you know you got the photographers to try to take images of what the event was going on and then one of the wrestlers just left uh and then but then they all just started leaving. Okay, so yeah, the wrestler that was leaving was Shawn Michaels. The one Shawn. that was in the ring in like the black singlet was Bret Hart. Right. 
And then you see Vince McMahon and a bunch of other people who I'll explain who they are later on the sideline. Uh, when it comes to this, before and after, you know, as we always do, like, before and after, who do you think's the villain in this? And who do you think, like, or, like, who do you think's in the wrong here? I think it, it's Brett, right? The one who walked off? Uh, no. Oh, no, it was, it was Sean. Sean. Sean, my bad. Sean, Sean. Well, I feel like it was Sean because they, he's the one that was seen angry while the, uh, while Brett just stayed on the ring, but I, it just feels like he was in the wrong because he did something wrong. I just, but I can't quite tell what he did. It just seemed like it was like a regular, you know, regular match like that was going fine along, but I think it was because of the ref called something that was ignored. Yeah, so, about 24 minutes left. You ready to hear the explanation? Yes. All right, so here we go. The context. Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels literally despised each other, like actual hatred, yet they still found ways to work together, you know? Right. And, you know, it's funny because in that video, you see Shawn Michaels winning and walking out with the title. Bret Hart was champion. And uh, previously, like around like WrestleMania 12, you know, their big show, uh, I believe uh, Bret Hart was champion. And then he dropped it to Shawn Michaels to give him like that WrestleMania one, give him that like, you know, uh, rub, you know, you know, give him that uh, push and get him over, you know, with the crowd. But, right. like, when the time came for Michaels to drop uh, the title to Hart, he didn't want to do it. You know, again, they had this hatred for each other, and they, Michaels didn't want to do it for him. And he ends up, like, I think vacating the bar, or giving it to someone else. So, you know, there's a lot of history and hatred behind these guys. Right. And also, at the same time, there's WWF at the time. Their rival company was WCW. And they were engaged in a ratings battle with WWF's Monday Night Raw with theirs, WCW's Monday Night Nitro. Right. I hope I got that right. And so, at this time, WCW kind of started winning the Monday Night War because they had poached, you know, some of WWF's big big stars like uh, Kevin Nash, Hulk Hogan, uh, Scott Hall, you know. I know you don't know right. these names, but I'm letting you know, like, these were, like, big names that went to the rival company. Right. And the upcoming pay-per-view, which this all happens at, is Survivor Series. This occurred in November of 1997. At the same time, mm -hmm. Bret Hart's contract was coming up, and WCW was offering him big money to go jump ship. You know? Right so there's already a conflict there. He's heading into a pay-per-view with his contract expiring, you know, and he's champion. That's another thing. He has their main world title. You know, he right. has the WWF championship, the big title. Man, he, he hasn't gotten a new contract yet, and the reason he doesn't is Hart was trying to stay loyal to the WWF, but there was conflict between him and Vince with the negotiation of his contract. And this conflict ends up leading to him walking into that event, Survivor Series, still champion, and not having a contract renewed. Essentially, oh. like, as soon as, like, the event ends, you know, he's almost like a free agent still, right? Right. And so, you know, there's conflict here because, you know, he's champion. He's not under contract. You don't want him leaving with that belt. And, you know, that was the big struggle was, you know, Vince wanted him to drop that title because he was afraid. He's paranoid. He doesn't want this man showing up on the on the rival show of his belt, especially because, believe it or not, it's happened before. Uh, their women's champion, Alundra Blaze, left for WCW, and she appears on WCW TV dropping the women's title into a trash can. So... Imagine the fear that's going through Vince's mind of like uh, he's probably having like images of the same thing happening but with his main belt, you know? Right, right, right. So, you know, he wanted Hart to drop that belt at the pay per view, but here's the biggest issue. He wants him to not only drop it to Shawn Michaels, the man he hates the most, he wants him to drop it to Shawn Michaels in his hometown of Montreal, Canada. Or right. I, I forget what, you know, like, region Montreal is. I think it's Quebec. I don't, yeah. think, I don't know Canadian geography. But so, you know, he wants Hart to drop it in his hometown to the man he hates the most. And Bret Hart was telling him, I don't want to do that. And he even said, look, 
despite not having a new contract, I'm willing to not drop the title on this event, but the next night, I'm willing to drop it, you know, because he, he, the next night Raw is, I'm pretty sure, not going to be in Canada. And so he's basically telling him, you know, I don't want to drop it in my home, my hometown, my home country. Let me do it the next night when we're not here. You know, I'll willingly do it, you know. But right. again, Vince kind of having that paranoia. He doesn't he doesn't want to take any risk. So he changes the plan without many knowing. As um, the commentator Jim Ross said, there was a select few of people that knew about this change, these change of plans. The people that had to know, obviously, were the ref, Michaels, uh, Triple H, who was like Shawn Michaels' best buddy and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and like, a few, like a few other people, probably the ones you see out there at the inner show, which include uh, Sergeant Slaughter, Gerald I think it's Gerald Briscoe, and I forget who the other one is, but, you know, basically, these people were kind of like former wrestlers, but then, as you'll see common nowadays, like, these wrestlers start working in the business, so they were probably guys, like, you know, working with the talent, working, like, on the business side of things, and it's crazy to think this, but uh, the commentator, Jim Ross, he also explained in an interview that uh, he was, at the time, he was head of talent relations, you know? And so right. people assumed he would have been on it, but he even said he knew nothing of it. And that's crazy to think because he's mainly the guy that negotiates and helps out with these talents. You know, he's yeah. the one that works with the talents and stuff. So, you know, he didn't even know about it. It was, a, it was such a select few that knew about these plans. And so, you know, Hart went into the match thinking, okay, we're doing this the way I said, you know, I'm going to win you know, and then I'll drop it the next night. And I'm pretty sure he said, like, he would drop it the next night, too. I can't remember if it was either The Undertaker or Shawn Michaels himself. He just didn't want to do it in Canada. Right. But so then, you know, they have the match. And then when it gets to the end of the match, Vince gets out there. And that's kind of how you know, okay, something's going on. Shawn gets Brett into the sharpshooter. And, you know, this is big because the sharpshooter is Brett's move. That submission you saw him put into, that is Brett's signature move. And the oh. ref looks, and, you know, you you as you brought up, you know, the ref's looking, and it looks like he's looking for something. He's looking to see if Bret Hart is tapping, and as you can tell through the camera and the fans in the arena can tell, nowhere is Bret Hart tapping. And even as you see, he even gets out of it and tries to get uh, Michaels into it. Uh-huh. But it's ready to lay at that point. The ref kind of looks, and you know the ref makes it up that he saw Brett tapping, and so he oh. calls for the bell. And from there, like I said at the beginning, chaos ensues. As you see, both Michaels and Brett Hart look at each, look at Vince like, "What the hell happened? What did you guys just do?" But the thing is, as you'll see, comment as I explain, uh, Michaels knew he was just trying to play it off to not get, you know, beat up or anything. Right, That's right. why you see him leave so quickly. He goes, grabs the belt, and you see people trying to get him to the back because they don't want him getting attacked, getting hurt, you know, getting beat up. So, you know, Triple H's buddy, Sergeant Slaughter, Briscoe, and all them get him out of there. And you see Brett, Brett staring at Vince, and Vince kind of just telling him that that's how it goes. And Brett spits right in his face, you know, because he feels so disrespected at this point, you know. Right, right. And... Even commentary didn't know how to react because, uh, again, they weren't told. Lawler, the other guys, uh, Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross didn't know. And uh, Jim Ross even says in interviews that Lawler kept trying to tell him where you went on, and he tells him, "No, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know a dang thing either." Oh. And so that uh, this is all happening on air, by the way. He's he spits yeah. on Vince. They get the commentators out of there because then uh, Bret Hart destroys the commentary. But he starts slamming the monitors. He's looking at the crowd, and even with the camera on him, he's spelling WCW in the air, the rival company. Right. And even more, uh, in an interview, Jim Ross says uh, that uh, at the time, they were filming a documentary for Bret Hart, so they're getting all this footage for his documentary. I see. Like, what better, what better footage could they have gotten than getting this live when it was happening? And so then what? it goes off air. Everyone gets to the back. And Bret Hart literally punches Vince McMahon, and Jim Ross said that Vince got a concussion from that. Jeez. And then Triple H apparently is getting cussed out by Bret's family, because the Hart family is actually like a full-on like wrestling family. They have had multiple people... 
from that family not only get trained by the main guy, but right. then uh, they've they've worked in wrestling. You know, there's Owen Hart, uh, Jim Neidhart, uh, you know, a bunch of guys from the Hart family being in wrestling. And so they're all cussing out Triple H and everyone there because they're like, what the hell did you guys just do? And the funny thing is, Shawn Michaels walks out of this without any damage because he mainly was lying his his, his butt off during this entire thing. He right, like right, even right. like in the locker room. I remember if I remember correctly, like Bret Hart said, like he literally would ask, he was literally asking Shawn when they were in the locker room, "Did you know anything about this?" And Shawn was basically saying, "No, I had no part in this. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what they did." But the entire time, he knew because how else wasn't he gonna know? He was he knew he had to be involved in that finish. Right, right, right. And so, after all that, Brett leaves for WCW. And, like, after his whole event, Vince basically just goes to his roster and tells him, look, if you can't understand why I did that, that's understandable. But you got to understand, I I had to do what was best for us, you know, our company, our business. Right. And then he uh, he infamously essentially tells them, you know... uh, if if you want to quit after these events, because you know the locker room's paranoid at, at this point, because they're like looking at that and like, well, if he can just change that on the fly like that, what's to say he can't do that with us? So he basically tells them, if you guys want to quit, you're more than right ahead. I'll be m- more than willing to help you all work on that. You know, getting your release from this company. And essentially, after hearing that, all the wrestlers are like, okay, yeah, you know, we're we're gonna stay put. Right. And then from there, Vince goes on TV and they kind of like interview him on Raw as like a segment. And up until this point, really, like people knew Vince was like, you know, the boss and like, you know, uh, or like they like they had only like recently like learned essentially like Vince was behind everything, you know, even though he owned the company and stuff. But so then he goes on TV like for Monday Night Raw and like a segment interview and he essentially says, you know, this screw job that happened, the Montreal screw job, was Bret Hart's fault, and that Bret screwed Bret. Like that was the, that's like the infamous line from us that he says, Bret Hart screwed Bret Hart. Nothing more of it. It was all like Bret Hart's fault. Yeah, right. And so this all in turn leads to essentially turning real life into storyline where Vince now uses that interview because he got a lot of hate for that interview, you know, basically putting all the blame on Brett. He turns that inter- he turns that interview into a into a new gimmick change where he's now this evil corporate boss. You know, because I mean Right, right, right. Yeah. It totally is essentially evil corporate boss and boss. He gets screwed over and I don't know where he's saying you're the one to blame for it, you know? And I'll get into like all the change after like you know what happens after these events but so what are your thoughts on just up until this point I I think that it's like it stretches way far up like beyond like what I saw and it's it's a tad bit confusing I'll be honest but but I I, am I am getting the general just but I feel like this is just all like this feels messed up if that makes sense and the thing that Vince did is just uh, and then throwing the blame on Brett mm. it, uh, how, how would you say it? it just this just feels like a whole you know literally like what, what's called it's called screw job it, it how would you say it? it makes sense of why it's called like that and it feels messed up of what just happened now that I'm thinking about it yeah. but yeah yeah and so you know Hearing all this, you you understand why it's a key piece of history for wrestling. But you're probably wondering, you know, what did I mean by it starts a whole new era, it causes a boom? Well, Vince becomes the e- evil corporate boss just in time because Stone Cold Steve Austin is on the rise, you know? Right. And he's on the rise with his gimmick of anti-hero, essentially, you know, badass Texan. And, right, right, right. So he comes in and he starts a feud with Vince McMahon where, you know, he's this essentially relatable guy to the audience where, you know, the audience, you know, people typically don't like their bosses and stuff, you know, and 
they're giving support to this guy because what is he? He's an employee, but yeah, he's beating up on Vince McMahon. You know, he's he's hitting him with the stunner. He's there's like multiple segments that in, include in this feud. Like you know, he's freaking dousing Vince with a beer truck. You know, he's beating him up. Even when uh, there's security lined around, he jumps into the ring and starts beating up on Vince. You know, so it's like he's essentially doing what all those fans couldn't do. You know, beat up the boss that they hated. Right. And so this feud, along with all the connecting pieces that go into this feud and other characters becoming on the rise, it sparks a huge rating and overall interest boost in wrestling, the WWF itself, and they start winning the ratings war against WCW. And, you know, years later in 2001, WWE would buy out, the, would, would, uh, buy out WCW, meaning they bought out their competition, they're out. They're now essentially the only wrestling, like, major wrestling promotion in uh, America. Right, right, right. And so this feud, like I said, you know, this feud, the moments that come from this era known as the Attitude Era, you know, spark this huge boost. And, you know, it allows the WWE to essentially see one of their best periods of wrestling because of, you know, ratings, overall interest, overall... uh how would you say, uh, like, media and culture influence, you know? Right. Like, they were, they, they became a hit in pop culture, and that's crazy to think of, because wrestling nowadays is so, like, niche. You know, but so, I, yeah. out of that one event, it sparks this biggest boom period to the point where, you know, they got so successful, they were able to buy out their competition, and for the longest time, we're the only big, uh, wrestling promotion in america you even though like even though tna got pretty big you know which was another wrestling promotion that came around like the 2000s -hmm. you most people wouldn't really argue that they were as big so you could realistically say it wasn't until like now 2019 to now where aew came into play and now like essentially you could say since they bought out wcw from 2001 all the way to 2019 they were the only real, like, major wrestling promotion in America. There was other right. minor ones and in indie, independent promotions, but they were the only big dog in there and yeah, yeah, yeah. all because of this one event. Right, right, right. Wow. So overall, what do you think about that? Like, I, I, infamous event, you would, you would think it would cause, like, a lot of controversy, maybe even see like some consequences for that when instead they see their biggest boom period or one of their biggest boom periods because of it yeah and like I feel like this is like the start of it all like the whole like storyline of like the evil Vince I think that like but I still feel like this is still messed up uh, you know uh, of its start but it kind of does rattle up the uh, the storyline per se if that makes any sense but, uh, wait, what, what, what year was this again? It was the 90s, right? 97. 97, yeah. Okay, so yeah, uh, I feel like that was, you know, in terms of for storyline purposes, this was uh, probably like a really good, uh, motivating factor to, uh, create the, the you know, the bad, the bad, uh, the, the bad, you know, the bad boss, per se. Yeah, especially because, like, ever since then, people have tried to replicate, you know, the whole evil boss gimmick, but, like, it's never been able to uh, be perfected and, you know, have the success that, like, Vince had with it. Essentially, because, you know, like I said, you know, that controversy sparked it all, and it's like, yeah, how could you not look at that as an evil boss? He screwed over his employees, but, you know, as always, there's two sides to it, you know? Yes, he screwed over the guy, but at the same time, it's like, you got to kind of understand where he was coming from. You know, he's paranoid about losing this guy to his rival company while he still has the belt. True, true, true. And we'll say, well, whatever happened to the, the other, the rival company? So, WCW gets Bret Hart, and they it's infamously known that they screw up and don't, like, he, despite paying them big money, they didn't really treat him as big of a deal. You know, as it, as he should have been. Mm-hmm. 
and you know they still were competing with WWE all these years, you know. But then it's like, as soon as they hit kind of like nineteen ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand and one, they just were making terrible decisions. They were like losing money because of how much they were paying a lot of these guys. Because that was the main reason people would jump ship is because oh they're paying more money, it's less days to work, you know. Right. And so it's like they were losing money. And so, like, in 2001, they're at, like, their lowest. And then Vince comes in and says, all right, I'm buying you guys. I'm buying you guys. I'm buying out, like, essentially the contracts of some of these wrestlers. Although a lot of the big names didn't want to come over. So, like, they just sat out their contracts. Mm -hmm. But so, essentially, he bought out the competition and then they were put out of business. WCW was no more. The only one reigning was was the WWF. Right, right, right. Wow. But so, I, I, what happened? Oh, no, that's essentially the the gist of it. I mean, later on, like, they bring Bret Hart back, like, later on, like, super late, like, 2010-ish, no. to have, like, a rivalry with Vince, but, like, they were two old men at that point. Like, they made it, like, a thing of, like, oh, they reconciled, but then... uh like, you know, Vince kind of turns on them and they turn into a storyline. Right. Where Bret Hart, like, beats up Vince McMahon at WrestleMania. But, like, I don't know. It's like it, they did that whole thing and, like, Bret kind of mentioned that, like, he reconciled with it. But then, like, to this day, he kind of still, like, brings it up and talks about it. Right, right, right. Interesting. I, I, I feel like, uh, how would you say this? It, it feels wrong, but it kind of ended up sort of okay. If that makes sense, well, yeah. like it was, it was a bad beginning, but like you know, the, late, the years later on, it, I mean, I guess it went well. Yeah, I mean, that's but, the funny thing about this whole story is that like it's the opposite of what you expect, and that the bad guys essentially won because WWE, WWE made all that money in the 90s and stuff and continue to boom even until now yeah yeah but I mean I mean coming to like you know present times it's you know the the layoffs with the wrestlers it's getting pretty bad but I think in the prime time you know way back when uh, I feel like I guess it went okay I mean I'm assuming the fans liked it in terms like what happened in terms you know the the storyline but, like, in terms of, like, actual, like, companies, you know, competing with one another and, like, you know, an actual company, like, getting bought out and having to, unfortunately, lose their name uh, for the, the, the wrestling, uh, you know, uh, for their matches and, like, you know, their stuff like that. But, but yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's all I got. So, overall, mate, what would you, like, rate this all? I don't remember what it rated. Uh, Deadshot versus um, what was it? I think you gave it. I think you gave it like a seven or eight, and then I think you also, I think you gave like a seven to the, the Undertaker storyline. Yeah, I remember that. I think I would. I mean, since this is the beginning of everything, technically in terms of like the storyline for Vince and you know the big bad boss. I mean, but then again, uh, you know, a whole company went under because of him, or bec- uh, because of what happened, the, the whole decision leading up to that moment. I would maybe give it like a like a six or a seven around that time. I mean, like, maybe like a seven or an eight, only because this was a like you know a very intense, you know, moment in time for you know the rival companies and for the bloom and growth for WWF and you know all of WWE as a whole. And with that, with that, we'll close out here with about 15 seconds. I've been your host, Jack Drama, my fellow co-host. Don McSteel. No time for an intro again, because it happened with Solis. But we want to thank you all for joining us for another episode of Season 2 of the Rule 34 Podcast. As always, if it exists, we have an opinion on it. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next episode.